following is a special presentation of CBC Sports. Did we get a little pop in our licensing here? The answer is probably yes. Did we get a little pop with our sponsors? But this wasn't about the money. This was about exposure. You only go through this career once. So you can't afford to screw up. You can't afford to be making mistakes. We're going to keep growing the game and making it bigger and better. And as the money grows here, don't change. I want to be in a position to average out 1-5. Jesus Christ. You're fighting for a job here. And unless we see you be more assertive, you're going to Kentucky Friday morning. Why, Dinch? Why? You got no chance to get the puck anyways. Maybe it is time to think about two officials and one line should have a Canadian division. That's right. Canadian check for about two million. Yeah, that'll do it. If we continue to grow, then our shot in the barrel will come also. He likes to say he oversees the greatest game on earth. All he has to do is sell it. Sell it, Gary Bettman does. On the job for less than six years, the NHL commissioner will have helped the league expand to 30 teams by the year 2000. The new teams have names like the Predators, the Thrashers, and the Wild. The new team owners tend to be flamboyant and free with their money. There are more sponsors. The big American TV deal is on its way. If the NHL feels bigger these days, it's largely thanks to Gary Bettman. There's only so much you can do with this face anyway. This year, he intends to make it bigger still with something he calls internationalization. Internationalization became the theme because once we decided we were going to the Olympics and shutting down for 17 days, we had no choice. Hockey fans have often argued that pro hockey players should be part of the Olympic Games. This year, Gary Bettman has finally made it happen. The Winter Olympics in Nagano will bring the NHL game to the world stage. The greatest players from the greatest league putting on the greatest hockey show the world has ever seen. As the 1997-98 season gets underway, that's the plan. NHL's international project begins to take shape right at the start of the season. The Vancouver Canucks and the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim will play their first two games of the season 8,000 kilometers away from home in Tokyo, Japan. This was a great opportunity for us who love this game to share the NHL game because we want Japan and other countries to start playing this great game. The league would also like someone else to pay for the Tokyo Games. Japanese electronics giant Dentsu becomes the major sponsor. Doing business in Japan, generally meaning promoting an event, requires you to have a local partner. Uh, and they also absorb the financial risk. For the NHL, these two games in Japan are an Olympic trial run, an historic chance to sell the NHL game. and some NHL licensed merchandise. Let's see what we get here. Merchandising only works with exposure. We're doing more business. Uh, it's not the leading licensed brand in Japan right now, but it's growing and we're doing it one step at a time. Tickets cost $400 a piece. They sell out in three hours. Ample evidence that overseas interest in the NHL game is growing. You know, this is a Friday afternoon. These people have been online for a couple of hours already. Some people, we were told, actually stayed through the night as the players come out here incredibly orderly, incredibly well behaved, and they just uh, can't wait to, to get their favorite players' autographs. I like Dallas and uh, Ducks, Mighty, Mighty Ducks. A lot. I, I love NHL. 104 years old. 36 inches high, 35 pounds. It's got about almost 
almost 2,000 names on it now. It's what North Americans want to play for, and now the world wants to play for it, which is great. Opening the NHL season in Japan has its drawbacks. Staging an NHL game is hard enough under the best of circumstances. Who is the timekeeper? It's hard to still okay. in Japanese. No, you're doing a good job. Okay, so basically he gets it from that gentleman then, yes. right? Okay, that's fine. Okay, this is an Anaheim goal from number 31. Number 31. Yep, 31 unassisted. Unass don't go there yet. Please go back. Okay. This is number th this is number 31 unassisted. Okay? Playing an NHL game is hard enough anywhere. We're going to have it perfect. Playing it halfway around the world. You want to go hard to the outside with the puck if you can't take that D-man deep. You want to make For the game of hockey and uh, spreading the word of the NHL, it's an important game to happen here. But our team can't get caught up in that. Our, our players can't get caught up in that. We're here to win a hockey game. That's all there is to it. And we happen to be playing on a rink in Tokyo, and uh, that hopefully is not going to matter. The expectations Vancouver's the new Vancouver captain, Vancouver. Mark Messier, is here. The big disappointment is that Paul Correa is not. The one NHL superstar of Japanese descent is back home, still unsigned by the Mighty Ducks. They're dropping the puck for the first time. A wave from North America, right here. Live in the Yogi Arena and back home in Canada on the CBC, the games are well received. Potentially a goal-saving defensive play right there. Mess on the fly, mess on the fly, mess on the fly. When Gary Bettman looks forward to the Winter Olympics in Nagano, he is pleased. While it wasn't a way to make a lot of money, it was an attempt at little or no cost to the league and the teams to get into the marketplace and get exposure and get people focused on NHL hockey. So we just weren't one of the other Olympic sports starting up in February. Down low. We got a very good, solid perception reaction. The teams split the series, but they arrive home jet-lagged. But Vancouver's Pat Quinn can see the upside. I think the mandate of Bettman and, uh, and of course, in partnership with the Players Association, uh, they want to look to international fields to uh, uh, develop our business, both from the standpoint of, of uh, building revenues, but, but also to the uh, standpoint of uh, building interest in playing the game. Uh, because as we grow, we're going to have to have more countries playing hockey to supply the players we need to play in the National Hockey League. The Olympics are still two months off, but already Canada's got Nagano fever. There's almost a frenzy in our country to find out who, what the list is. And the fans everywhere you go, there's pools and all of that. And... That's just great to see that hockey means so much to this country. Maybe it's not quite the same names on the, the video. Most the most famous Canadian team of all time was Bob Clark's team, the one that defeated the Russians in 1972. Tonight, when this year's Olympic hockey team selections are telecast nationwide, the final say belongs to Bob Clark. Where we've just seen this thing build in all week and tonight at 6.30 when the list is unveiled it's going to be as big an announcement as ever been done in this country in sport. And we probably got 30 or 40 that really felt that they had a shot at this team. 30 or 40 players for a 23-man roster? For the team's managers that's a good thing. For the players it's just the opposite. It was the best kept secret in Canada for sure. You know, it was just like anybody else. You know, we all had to watch it on TV, and you know, so it was uh, a bit nerve-wracking. What's the mood like in Ottawa? There's Scott Russell. Scott? Oh, what's the mood like, Ron? A tremendous feeling of anticipation, nervousness, call it what you will, but it's wonderful to see amongst the professional hockey players. From Campbell River, B.C., to Campbell River, Colombie-Britannique, Rod Grandamoon! <laughs> From Oshawa, Ontario, the Shawa, Ontario, Joe! Manitoba, the Russell Manitoba, Tijuana Flurry. I just heard it. I 
just heard it. from Bob Clark's list. A six-time Stanley Cup winner, the spiritual leader of every team he has ever been on, has not been selected. Those who follow the NHL game want to know why. And then we'll be straight to questions and answers. Okay. Yep. We'll get through that quickly. I'll get... I guess with the opening remarks, I he said the journalists are going to ask about why Lindros is going out of sea. I'll just say Lindros will be the captain and... Sackick and Isaac are the assistants. Yeah. And I, I might as well mention then that uh, Paul Correa is going to join the, yep. the uh, national team on Monday, the 1st of December. Mm -hmm. Just curious of the decision on Mark Messier and how that the thought process went in excluding him from the team. It wasn't uh, our position to exclude anybody, Mike. We, we tried to put together what we felt would be the best team. For Bob Clark, there has never been any doubt about who would lead Team Canada to Nagano. The Philadelphia Flyers have been built around Eric Lindros. Lindros seems to be the young horse that Canada wants to ride now, and he's proving to be a terrific leader, and he's had the opportunity to play with all these great players. Uh, we think that, uh, that Lindros was the right choice. As Flyers GM, Clark is currently in deep contract negotiations with his star center. I think it was time that uh, a new group of players from our country uh, started taking some of the responsibility. Lindros could be a captain for the next Olympics and the one following that, too. Great. And let's do one more with a smile and looking here. Great. Excellent. You're all finished. More than a billion viewers watch the Atlanta Summer Games every day. Who knows how many will tune into Nagano? Nike comes on board early, buying the rights to design and manufacture Olympic hockey team jerseys. Russia, you know, this pattern on the arm is taken from the basilica. You know, the color of the brick is the maroon from the basilica. In the end, scores of corporate sponsors get involved. In the weeks leading up to Nagano, the NHL star players are everywhere. I think it's every kid's dream to play in the Olympic Games. Nothing can compare to playing for your country. I've played for Canada before, but this is the Olympic Games. It'll be one of Canada's No matter who Olympic wins the gold teams. medal in Nagano, Gary Bettman is confident that the NHL will come out on top. Shh. The Russian team is next door. When you have a sports league and you're competing with all the other forms of entertainment and all the other sports, you've got to do everything possible to, to build your brand. You know what else would be great? If we spoke Russian. This has been, over the last five or six years, a very difficult retail marketplace for all branded merchandise, licensed merchandise, especially for sport. The way you have to hold this. Having said that, over each of the last five years, we've had double-digit increases in our share, in our growth. We're still not as big as I think we need to be or we can be but we're heading in the right direction. Because I'm real photogenic. It shouldn't be too tough. I hope we all get a free truck out of this. <laughs> Chrysler Canada was the only automotive manufacturer that owned the Olympic rings. And therefore, uh, having the professional hockey players from the NHL who were playing on the Olympic team meant that we could leverage both of those in our advertising support, not just to get exposure for Chrysler, but also to congratulate the athletes for what they did. At the Winter Olympics in Nagano, Japan. We were in every other TV network, just reminding people that, hey, Dodge is with them. Chrysler is with the athletes and we're supporting them. For the National Hockey League, it's just a totally a win-win situation in a sense is, um, you know, merchandising over there. And then secondly, as far as marketing and promoting our sport worldwide, I think in the end of the day that this will be a great situation for the whole game of hockey. Well, that's good. So you've been doing a lot of reading a bit? 
Well, we'll be doing a lot more. And the crew that we've assembled here and met for the last few days, the nine guys total 174 years of professional hockey experience. In an accessible like the NHL players chosen for the Olympics, the NHL officials have been selected with great care. Kerry Fraser, Mark Fossett, and Bill McCreary are among the league's most respected referees in big game situations. Fighting in an excess, in excessive manners is a match penalty. The Olympics are played under International Ice Hockey Federation rules. Officials will be expected to enforce stiff regulations on everything from fighting and obstruction to shootouts and the curve of a goaltender stick. Um, the goalie stick regarding the curvature, is that half inch like everybody else's? It's in metric. <laughs> oh, baby. <laughs> everything's, everything's metric. Everything in the rule book is metric. Oh, no. We're going to have a very, very exciting and competitive hockey tournament because the caliber of talent will be spread throughout the participating teams and to have uh, best on best uh, at the world's biggest stage for sporting events, we think will be another step in the march for increased exposure. And so we're very excited about the opportunity. Game on Earth now offers the coolest credit card on Earth. It's the official no annual fee NHL MasterCard issued by NBNA Canada. Call toll free 1 877 Hockey 9 and apply for the credit card featuring your favorite NHL team logo. Score with exclusive cardholder benefits and save with a low introductory annual interest rate. A credit card made for hockey fans like you. The official no annual fee NHL MasterCard. Call toll free 1 877 Hockey 9 now to apply for your official National Hockey League MasterCard. The international thematic carried through to the All-Star Game. We thought it would be kind of neat to have North America play the world. 70% of our fans thought it was terrific and were in favor of it. It made the All-Star Game uh, even a little more fun than usual. <laughs> For this game to be successful, it's got to be competitive. And we're not talking about that it's going to be a lot of hitting or anything different like that. We know the type of players who play here. It's a high-octane game, and that's fine. But a 10 to 10 this game, year's all-star game isn't the usual east-west affair. It's the international showdown, North America against the world. With the international flavor to this year, we started the season with games in Tokyo. We have North America versus the world here on this weekend. And then, of course, we're heading to Nagano shortly. Congratulations and good luck. Have fun this weekend, guys. Now, question for you. After the first one... Everyone involved sees the game as an Olympic preview. Yeah. In the house, I would like to be able to do a quick interview with somebody from the winning relay while the one-on-one -on -one guys are being taken through the course and getting ready for that. From my understanding, CBC was doing all interviews since it's in Canada. Um, so it's taking a feed from you guys yeah. as opposed to taking a feed from ESPN in the States. No, no, I, I understand. Yeah, okay. The game and the skills will be seen in over 160 countries. Uh, we have about 10 to 15 international crews here as we get ready for our big push uh, to Nagano. Uh, ESPN is covering the skills on Saturday in the United States and in Canada, CBC and SRC. We have an MTV special. We have a Comedy Central special. And at the end of the day, we also have uh, Power Week, which gets seen in another 160 countries. So there's a lot of great exposure for us as a sport. And this is our weekend to kind of shine and come out front. Yeah, it needs more smoke for the show. People are given lots and lots of choices as to how to spend their leisure time and their leisure dollars. People want to be entertained. They want to go to arenas that have all the amenities. They want to feel good about the experience, particularly for newer and younger fans. And that's important. I like the idea. Who come up with the idea of the North America against Europe? I'll answer that question after four. Oh, after I, game's over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get your style. I like that style. I like that style. If it's, if it's, Even the players sent something special about this year's contest. I think there's so many good European players that people don't have a chance to see them all. And, uh, and in this type of format, to really see their talent and really see them shine as a team. Three weeks from now, they'll be facing off against each other in Japan. A sellout crowd of 18,000 watches the game live. In Europe, a record 25 countries tune in.
North America wins the All-Star Game, but the highlight of the All-Star Weekend is the skills competition. Buffalo goalie Dominic Hasek was born and raised in the Czech Republic. He faces North America's five best shooters. Hasek because they really never know what he's going to do. Brian Leach can't beat Dominic Hasek. Scott Niedermeyer, the next up to try and win it. Then he shoots wide. Joe Sackick. The All-Star game was well received. The game was fun. It was interesting. It was more competitive than usual. Uh, and the research tells us that the fans liked it. Wayne Gretzky for the win. if we did it again. Hasek has always been a great goaltender. This year, he's been unbelievable. The world team wins the shootout, but for the North Americans, they're still Nagano. Passion. You know the feeling. Some say it's just a game. But you breathe life into it. Anger, joy, admiration. It's how it makes you feel. It's not about the contracts, the crowds, or the glory. It's about staring fear in the eye and not giving in. Playing past the pain and going for it all. You make it what it is and what it will become. Strength, pride, courage. It's more than just a game. It's who we are. It's who we will be. It can unite a nation and define a country. It's our game, and nobody can take that away. It's tradition. Keep it alive. The one and only Hockey Night in Canada on CBC. In early February, the NHL's international campaign reaches its final destination. Going into this tournament, this has all the credentials of being like 72 was. We actually watched the 72 series on the way over on the plane. We've never been to Olympic Games before as uh, athletes, most of us. People here haven't had an opportunity to see some of the best players in hockey be here, and everyone's excited about it. One of the things the NHL wanted to do for the game was to really showcase our sport. And without question, it's on center stage. We're going to get an opportunity to show how great this game is. Interrupting the NHL's regular season for 17 days hasn't been easy, even for Gary Bettman. There were a whole host of issues related to how the tournament was going to be played, what kind of travel, what the gateway cities were going to be, where the players were going to stay, how we were going to play the tournament, how long the season was going to shut down for, what kind of compression we were going to have, when we were going to begin the season, when we were going to end the season, and on and on and on. And it was made even more difficult by the fact that we were going to do this halfway around the world. The question now is, will all the disruption be worth it? Will the players deliver? Will the league's long-term interests be served? It was a good dry run if we decided we want to do it again in Salt Lake City. But this wasn't about the money. This was about exposure. All signs are positive. Japanese reaction to the Canadian team overwhelms even veteran players like Theo Fleury. I don't think any of us expected, you know, the reception that we got. Canadians are very popular. People can identify with Canada and the Japanese people, you know, as a nation are pretty friendly and outgoing and they've made it very easy for us to be in their country. Everybody's very excited to be here. I think I can speak for all the team. Uh, I genuinely um, see great excitement in, in the dressing room, great excitement from the players, great anticipation uh, for the games starting to begin. I think every one of our players to a man, every one of the coaches, every one of the management staff, 
all understand that the uh, tournament is one in which there is a great field. Belarus. Fleury is keeping a video diary of the trip. In the dressing room, he and the others find a collection of Canadian Olympic team sweaters dating back to the 1920s. I, I like to wear that one. A reminder of Canada's proud hockey history. In every player's locker, Bob Clark has left another motivational surprise. Pictures of the players before they became stars. Give it all the guys just for, guys for about two minutes here. We're here, we're here with a purpose, we're here with a focus. You know, we're going to do whatever we can to, to make sure that we come up with the, uh, the outcome that we want. I think that's the attitude that we want to have. Let's continue to have that. I think we really got to be uh, smart about how we eat and how much we eat because the, the weight is something you can really put on. This is going to be home for a long, uh, long couple of weeks, guys, so let's make it, uh, make it good. This ain't a bad roommate right here. I thought it was excellent at the village, you know. When you play major junior hockey, you know, you, you sleep on the floor of a bus for four years, so to stay in a village uh, like that, you know, is no problem. The Canadians have decided not to go the dream team route. They may be millionaires, but for the next two weeks, they will live like all the other athletes at these games. All right. Cool. Good, how are you? Yeah, I'm Dave's mom. <laughs> we're all excited, the attention that we're getting. The commissioner is in Nagano too, holding press conferences and hoping for the best. If this is successful, is it is it TV ratings? Is it uh, if markets are opened up elsewhere? How do you determine it's, if it works? It's a, it's, a, it's a variety of things. Part of it is the reaction. It's what kind of attention this got for our game. Uh, how big a building block it was, and, and part of that is how much you write about us, uh, how many people actually get an opportunity to see the games on television, what the overall response is, how the, how the players felt about it. In the final analysis, the players are the ones who have to play, and we understand that. competing teams have just three days to get used to being here. The now team that makes the best the adjustment right will likely win the gold medal. For Team Canada, that means adjusting to the big ice. To either the, this guy hitting up in there or that guy coming in behind. It's going to be an adjustment for all of us, the defense, the forwards. It's a different game as far as playing behind the net goes. Uh, there's obviously a lot more room. And it's an adjustment we're all going to have to make, both offensively and defensively. Canada has size, speed, and superb puck control. No one can spot a weakness. Sweden has a strong team, too. With 18 NHL players, many expect the defending Olympic champions to end up on the podium again this year. Russia has 22 NHL players and in Vladimir Yurzanov, a highly respected coach. The Czech Republic has one of the NHL's leading scorers, Jaromir Jagr, and in Dominik Hasek, the league's best goalie. But no one is expecting miracles. Half the players on the Czech roster don't play in the NHL. The Americans won the World Cup two years ago. They are expected to make it to the gold medal round. You're worrying about concepts, getting guys to understand that uh, in Europe it's an east-west game as much as it is north-south. We're, we're two points of the compass in, in, at home, and here you've used all four. The Canada-U.S. game is seen as a preview of the gold medal final. This worries Gary Bettman. Too many people, particularly in the media, were willing to equate the performance of the U.S. team and the Canadian team with the success of the endeavor. It's not quite fair and it wasn't quite what we had bargained for going in. Okay, now listen to me. We're going to have a really good game and there's going to be no bullshit, all right? We'll play like men, you get treated like men. Like Bettman, Brian Burke feels the media is getting carried away. Someone asked me, wouldn't it be nice to have a gold medal game between Canada and the U.S.? And I said, whoa, 
I said, you had better look at these rosters before you talk about that. I said, the North American arrogance and ignorance shining through that question. Well, they play like that with Gary. Should I do my best to try and make that save? Or if he's in the crease? You, you make the save, all right? Both feet are in the crease like that. It's no goal, Patrick. This was truly a great tournament. Nothing like this dream team stuff. This was a dream tournament. The Olympics offer an exciting brand of offensive hockey North Americans seldom get to see. The big ice limits obstruction. Fighting is not permitted under international rules. The NHL has been thinking of tightening up its rules as well. Before the Olympics, they had drawn up the plan for the obstruction rules. And, I, and, and they were going to enforce these rules post-Olympics. So I'm sure as they watched the game on the larger rink, they must have been thinking, it'll be interesting to see if our obstruction rules will work and can open the game up and maybe make the game a little bit more offensive, make it a little bit more entertaining, more like the game they were viewing in Nagano. But the league's commissioner says he likes the NHL game. The U.S. is going to have a tough time. I'm not a fan of, of the big ice, and people tend to confuse the big ice with no obstruction. Guys, I only need one penalty. It's just one man only. It makes it easy. The fact is, when you have your 125 best skilled, most skilled players playing, you're apt to see less obstruction. Does he like the big ice or what? Uh, I think our ice surface uh, is preferable to big ice. This is over. So Canada handles the USA today in their big meeting by defeating the United States 4-1. Brad Hull and his American teammates take the loss to Canada hard. How devastating would it be if you guys don't know? We already asked that one. No. I don't know, because we're, I'm certainly not thinking that. Nobody's thinking that, I don't think. I hope not, because if someone's thinking that, that's the only one guy it takes to... Uh, Even like up there talking to Hull, he was talking about how... Um, you know, after a couple of games, they still haven't worked out exactly what they want to do, and he was calling his teammates selfish and all that. They didn't come here not to win, and we want to win as badly as anyone. They were hoping that the fallout wasn't going to be as bad as it would be. The, the publicity they got out of it was almost all negative, and I think that they had hoped that while they wouldn't get the big bump that they'll get in, they're hoping for in Salt Lake in 2002, it didn't turn out that way. I mean, it, in a lot of ways, it went horribly wrong. Two days later, after losing to the Czech Republic, U.S. team members go out on the town. Later that night, at the athletes' village, they break chairs and spray fire extinguishers about. Damage is only estimated at $3,000 U.S., but for Gary Bettman and the NHL, the cost is incalculable. I think the NHL shocked, and I think Gary Bettman was shocked, how many reverberations there were from this, and particularly with the U.S. team. Uh, this, this type of conduct, if it can be proven and established, can't be condoned. I'm more disappointed that the players who were responsible just didn't come forward and say, whoops, we made a terrible mistake, we're sorry. Uh, the incident, you know, took on a bigger life because of that. For the first time, Gary Bettman's international project is in trouble. America's NHL players are out of the games, but Canada's are still in it. Now it's up to the Canadians to show the world the superiority of the North American NHL style of play. Canada needs to beat the Czech Republic to move on to the gold medal game. Canada and the Czech Republic. Canada undefeated. Coming into the game, the Czech Republic, Harry, lost only once. There's just one problem. The Czechs are great realists. If, if you are a country the size of the Czech Republic, and if, you, if you've had the history of Central Europe, you've got to be a realist. And the Canadians want to throw a lot of rubber. The Czechs in the early 70s, they had one rival, the Soviet Union. How do we beat them? You allow the Soviets always to force the play. 
and then what you do is you try to you get them to commit themselves, you intercept a pass, you break back two on one, and you score occasionally and often enough to win. And, and you have as your backbone in the other end good goaltending. And then you can win. Well, the Czechs really haven't changed in terms of their style of play. Czechs played probably and used the ice better than any of the other European teams because they had eight guys that have played that style all year long, haven't been, have been untouched by the NHL. One of the things that Canada's always been successful at in international competition is putting together a series of seven or eight good shifts in a row that shifts the game, gets the other team back on their heels, and boom, we score. We just seem to have a couple of good shifts, never enough in a row, in succession, to really give the other team the impression, uh-oh, here comes Canada. Lindros, can you do it? The shot, block, rebound! What a save by Hudson! With 63 seconds left in regulation time, Canada finally scores. After 10 minutes of overtime, it's still 1-1. Under international rules, tie games must now be decided by something that occurs regularly in international tournaments, but never in the NHL. The problem for me with the shootout is that it's an artificial contest. It's a contest that bears no relationship to the rest of the game. It's penalty shots, and a goalie and a team will face maybe one, maybe two penalty shots in, in a whole season. It's exciting. I find it unfulfilling. Whatever their merits or shortcomings, shootouts are unlikely to be seen in NHL games anytime soon. I will sit as long as it takes to have that game be decided by the players who played the game to that point. I admit that it's exciting. There's no, you know, in hockey, there's no better challenge than the goal or against the shooter. It's the ultimate matchup. But for me, it's a little too contrived. If I was at that level, with something that important to be decided for the rest of my life, I would be wondering, well, what if we what if we had played the game to finish? I wonder what it would, what really would have happened if the players and the teams and the coaches decided the outcome rather than you know the shootout. You know, with breakaways, when you have a 50-50 opportunity of scoring, you can't really second guess yourself and beat yourself up because you missed. It's just unfortunate that, you know, a game such as that, you know, played so well by both teams, it had to end that way. The Czechs score only one goal on Patrick Roy. No! Dominic Hasek takes care of the rest. So it just shows that the game is healthy in a lot of places, and I think the fact we didn't win it, um, obviously it bothers us. We would have loved to have won it, but the fact we didn't win it is not a bad thing. It's good for the game. I mean, it makes us a little hungrier for the next one, and uh, it makes the Europeans very proud of their performance. It was almost like, you know, someone close or a family member had died. The feeling you have, the empty feeling. The next day, Canada loses the bronze medal game to Finland. Whether you're a seven-year-old playing in a uh, championship tournament game or a 37-year-old playing in a game like this, it's devastating. And, uh, you never get over it. You never learn to accept it. And each and every time, it's just um, very, very difficult to accept and understand. It's, it's like you let your country down, and you let your teammates down. And... It's a completely empty feeling. You just want to stick your head in the ground. We've always put teams together fairly quickly and had some success, but you know, we didn't have success this time. And it had nothing to do with the players or anything, but if we don't learn from this and, and make the changes that are necessary to try and win the, the next time in Salt Lake City, then we'd be foolish. They would have represented the model for every team after of, of how you prepare yourself for a tournament. 
everything worked except they didn't score a goal in the first 60 minutes of the game against the Czech Republic. Uh, if they had, I suspect that they would have won a gold medal. And the legendary stories of how that team was put together, you know, would have followed. But it didn't happen. Or made the tough decision to sell the team. May or may not be the last hurrah for the Quebec Nordiques. should have a Canadian division. Uh, you guys up there, come down there once a week. We're just doing everything we can well, we're paying almost 50% more than the American team has. I mean, the Oilers sell out every game, and they can't afford to be here. It's sad. It's very sad. Part 4 of the new ice. For the first time in over a decade, European teams sweep the Olympic medals. The Czech Republic, gold. Russia, silver. Finland, the bronze. From my point of view, I think it's still a good outcome for the game. Disappointing for us in Canada and North America. But uh, the NHL gained a lot of valuable exposure, and I think uh, it was still pretty impressive hockey. For Canada, no medal, just a lot of soul searching. Many North American journalists see the medal result as an indictment of the NHL. The NHL has always prided itself in being perceived as the best league in the world. And all of a sudden, the curtains were pulled back, and that wasn't true. You know, the king had no clothes, but, that there were other leagues. There were a bunch of fine Czech players who were better than the best NHL players on both Canadian and the U.S. team. And I think it really exposed the NHL to a certain extent. The commissioner takes some especially hard hits. For Gary Bettman, this year couldn't have been worse. From the way people looked at the game, to the people who looked at his expansion plans, to a lot of things. And then came the Olympics. And for Bettman, this was the ultimate disaster, because as the guy who believes that style can overcome substance, that selling the game is what we didn't understand before and marketing it, and then everybody would think it was wonderful. All of a sudden, that was thrown back in his face, because everything went wrong. The aftermath of the of the U.S. experience in, in Nagano was, was, was a disaster for the league. But I felt all along that breaking and playing for the Olympics was, was a mistake to begin with. Because I, I think that what the league does by stopping its season for two and a half weeks and using all of its energy to promote the Olympics is telling the fans that the regular season just isn't really important. That the season isn't important, but the Olympics are important. And then, you know what, the playoffs will come along later and, and then... You know, that'll be important, too. Bettman sees it differently. I think there was too much confusion between the endeavor having this great Olympic tournament with the world's best players representing their countries and the performance of either the U.S. or the Canadian teams. I will say, and I don't think I'm going out on a limb by saying it, that had the U.S. team played the Canadian team in the gold medal game, there would have been scant criticism of the endeavor. Despite the criticism, Gary Bettman feels the NHL's international campaign has been a success. The 1998-99 season opener will again take place in Tokyo. The format of next year's All-Star Game is yet to be determined, but it will again likely feature North America versus the world. The league's participation in the 2002 Olympics in Salt Lake City is still up in the air, but chances are the NHL will be there. For Gary Bettman, NHL hockey remains the greatest game on earth. His job is just to sell it. The reaction internationally has been that this is fabulous, that the Olympics were great and they want us to do it again. All the federations the television coverage, the exposure, the ratings throughout Europe and the rest of the world were phenomenal. It's a building process. You do it one step at a time, and it was a good, good, good first step.